Thanks for joining us this evening for our Benefits and Beauty of Landscaping with Native Plants webinar. This event is brought to you by King Conservation District, which is a non-regulatory special purpose district that focuses on natural resource conservation in King County. We provide technical assistance to King County residents in forest management, farm conservation planning, wildfire preparedness, and streamside and shoreline enhancement. KCD has many different environmental programs, and one focus is education and outreach programs such as this one. Tonight, you'll learn all about how you can use native plants to make your yard beautiful and ecologically healthy. So, to get started, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to our resident native plant expert, Marin Carpenter. All right, so when we're talking about native plants, you may wonder, native to where? So, we're talking about this Puget Lowland area, the area sort of between the Olympics and the Cascades. Um, there may be some overlap with the entire state and all the way you know, up to British Columbia and down into Oregon or even California. Some of these plants have a much wider range, but these are the plants that we're gonna be talking about tonight are, are um, happy in this area, right in this little Puget Lowland area. All right, so we talk about non-native then. So non-native are um, species that have been introduced from other parts of the country or world and may include a lot of the ornamental species that you find in your own yard. They're not necessarily bad, they just are not from around here. Then we talk about invasive species. So invasive species are non-native and typically have an advantage over our native species in our environment due to limited herbivory from animals, a lack of diseases that impact them in this new environment, um, or a highly successful reproductive method. In the picture here, we have in the top uh, left-hand corner, we have Himalayan blackberry, which can form large thickets, putting it, um, it can put on more than 25 feet of growth in a single year and can become a monoculture, just kind of your, your whole yard could become blackberry, lucky us. Um, then down below it, we have a really beautiful plant, um, <laughs> butterfly bush. I know a lot of people really enjoy its beautiful purple flowers, um, but it does tend to be able to really grow all over the place. Um, it can grow really happily in areas that are disturbed or even in our natural areas and has a highly successful reproductive method, releasing thousands of seeds for each flower head um, spreading across the land and by water um, and wind. And next we have in the middle here, we have cherry laurel. Um, cherry laurel is often seen as a hedgerow. People like it for its privacy. Um, and this plant can spread really easily because it produces a lot of berries and birds will carry those berries all over the place and share them with your neighbors and the rest of your yard and natural areas um, throughout. So uh, they can be easily spread and cherry laurel has a fun little feature that it actually can prevent other plants from growing and germinating underneath it and around it. So it can really prevent our native species from growing and taking off. And then on the side here, on the right side, we have English ivy, which is really common. I'm sure you've seen it many places. Um, it's a ground cover, it'll crawl all over and it will prevent other plants from germinating. It'll crawl up onto our native plants and up trees, which is when it's climbing up the tree, the only time it can actually produce berries. But once it climbs up that tree, it can become something that acts like a sail and really can make your tree more vulnerable to falling during wind. Uh, using native plants can help prevent propagation of invasive plants and can help 
the new invasives from being introduced into the areas. So first tonight, you know, we're talking about English ivy. We have on the right side, or on the, is that the right side for you all? <laughs> the left side. <laughs> on the left side for you all, we have um, English ivy. And people really enjoy it because it's a bright, you know, evergreen ground cover and it can, you know, be be pretty, but it can cover up issues like erosion and uh, it doesn't have a very robust root system in terms of holding our soil in place. And so you can think about alternatives tonight. And one of the alternatives you might think about instead of English ivy is another evergreen species that is native. We have uh, Salal here and that has these kind of egg shaped leaves and cute pink little orange urn flowers, um, and then it produces little red berries. And those berries are pretty tasty. People, people tend to like those. All right, so we're gonna go for next, we'll talk about putting the right place, uh, ramp, right plant in the right place. And in order to do that, we need to consider three things, the soil in the area, the water availability, and the sun availability. So first, we're going to talk about the soil, which has a lot to do with the water availability. And so we want to start with just a general sort of geologic history <laughs> lesson. So, um, uh, so the Puget Sound was formed by the movement of glaciers over 15,000 years ago. And the Seattle area was once covered in a sheet of ice that was up to a mile thick, maybe even a bit more. Um, and so that was the Puget lobe of the Cordilleran ice sheet. And as that ice sheet moved across our region, it scarred and really carved out the area, um, creating what is now the Puget Sound region. And this did three things. It created a hard pan layer. That's the layer underneath the upmost layer that is like cement. It's impervious to, um, to water. And so you can, if that's kind of higher up in your soil, then it can create a lot of ponding and pooling. Um, and then next, it left a lot of glacial outwash and it helped to form post-glacial river deposits. So here we have a picture of a glacier. This one I think is in Canada. Um, and you can see the meltwater running off down at the bottom here and those through those braided rivers. Those really deposit a lot of sediment. And then on the toe of that glacier, the end moraine, you can see a lot of deposits just built up there at the bottom. And that deposit is a very rocky, sandy soil mixture. Um, and so on our hills in the Puget Sound area, we have really droughty, um, rockier, uh, more sandy soil. And then we have our more fertile river valleys. Um, the glaciers help to form our river valleys and the water running through these valleys deposits a substantial amount of sediment. During floods, the sediment is deposited, deposited more widely, making the entire valley fill with more mucky soils that are also much more fertile making them good for like farmland, as you see in the Kent Valley and um, things like that. Um, this has also buried that layer we were talking about, that hard pan layer that's uh, impermeable to water and made it so it's so low below the top layer that it's no longer really relevant in this area. So just to recap, on the hills, we have rockier, drier soils typically, and in the valleys, we have muckier, more fertile soils. 
And you may have, you know, a bit of variation in your own property. Next, we're going to consider sunlight. So sunlight provides energy to plants uh, that they use to make sugars that sustain them. Uh, all plants need sunlight, but too much sunlight can be damaging to them, just like it can be to us. So when we're talking about sunlight, we want to think about um, the aspect that the sun is coming onto our hills. So the sun tracks along the south in the northern hemisphere. So the southern side of a slope tends to be hotter and drier than the northern side. Here you can see the northern side of this hill is nice and green, covered in trees, and the south side has received too much sun, making it really hot and dry and a hard, uh, hard place for plants to really thrive. And then next, you have to consider east and west. So um, because the sun rises in the east, sets in the west, um, the east side tends to have um, a colder sort of, you know, the sun's rising. It doesn't experience as much direct sun at that point. There's still dew on the ground and the air is cooler. Then once it gets over to the west side, the sun has been up for a long time, the air temperature has risen, the dew has all evaporated, and so the west side tends to get more heat, more sunlight. All right, and so when we're planning projects, we tend to make ourselves maps so that we can kind of figure out, map out what considerations we need to think about while we're putting our projects together. And you can really do the same. So on this map here, in that yellow section, we have a dry, sunny area. It's a bit more upland from the water, so we can expect it to be a bit drier, and we can expect it to be sunny because it doesn't have any tree coverage. Then on the red section here, we have dry, again, because it's more upland, but then it's a sun and shade combo. It's kind of dashed with trees, and so that can be, you know, something that produces sun in some areas, shade in others, um, kind of just depending on which side of that tree the plant's falling on. And then in that green section all around the lake, we expect that to be very wet because it's right next to water, the water level fluctuates, and it's going to receive a lot of sun because there isn't tree coverage um, blocking the light in that section. And you can make a map just like this one if you wanted to um, using King County IMAP. So that's a, a mapping tool that King County has. Um, on their website, anybody can go there and you can type in your address, search it, find your parcel, zoom in on it, and then it has drawing tools that you can use to map out, draw polygons onto the map, and you can even use it to measure your property and things like that to get a general idea, of maybe how many plants you would need to, to fill an area. So tonight, we're going to talk a bit about plants. Before we get to all of the species, we want to talk about what forms they come in. And so there are a few different forms. We're going to talk about the pros and cons of each. There are bare root plants, container plants, and live stakes. So first, we'll talk about potted material. Um, potted material you know, the pros of a potting material is that it has the best survival rate. Um, they are available at nurseries and home improvement stores. You can find them even at the grocery store. You know, you can find them all over the place. Um, maybe not native plants, but you can really get your hands on, on potted plants pretty easily. Uh, they are simple to plant. Most people I'd say have had a chance in their life, maybe, hopefully, to plant a plant uh, from a container. And so you feel somewhat familiar with it. And then um, they can be held in that 
form for a long time. Say you buy them, you don't have time, you can really hold them for you know, months up to a year if you really needed to in that pot, as long as the roots aren't getting um, too big for that pot. And then there are a few cons. So these potted plants are the most expensive uh, option. They tend to be, you know, $5 per plant if you're getting them from like a wholesale nursery, maybe a bit cheaper if you're lucky. And then they can get significantly more expensive if you're buying them from a nursery, uh, you know, up to 15, 20, sometimes even more per plant. And another thing is that they may come with weeds from that nursery. You know, the nurseries have weeds in them, I can tell you that for sure, we have to pull them constantly. So, you know, there may be something in that seeds, uh, in that soil that introduces something to your, to your property. Um, and then they can take up a lot of room when you're transporting them. So you might need a truck to get 100 plants, whereas with other options, you may not. So next we're gonna talk about live stakes. Uh, live stakes are cuttings from species like willow, red osier dogwood, cottonwood, black twinberry, spirea. There's a few others that can handle being cut as well. But generally they're cuttings that are three feet or longer uh, from a dormant plant. And so once the leaves have fallen off and they just have buds, then you can cut uh, a section from that tree stick it in the ground the same direction it was going and the buds that are below ground will become roots and the buds above ground will become branches and it's pretty cool. Uh, some of the pros about that would be that they grow really nicely in wet sites. They can be a good option if you have a lot of an invasive species like reed canary grass where it's you know really hard to plant straight into and you can harvest them from your own property so they can be inexpensive or other people's property if you have a friend that has a plant you enjoy you know you could ask them to share um and they're really easy to transport like a bundle of say a hundred of them could fit in your hands and there are a few cons. They have a higher mortality rate. You know, if they don't get enough moisture, they don't have roots in the first year or not many. So they have a harder time absorbing water and um, growing with that lesser root system. They really don't grow much that first year, but after they're established, they, they move pretty quickly. And then another con, I guess, is that beater, beavers really love them. They're just a, a stick in the ground and beavers are always looking for a stick. So if you have that, you know, may not be the perfect option, but beavers are, you know, determined to get most plants if, if they don't uh, taste bad. So <laughs> uh, next here we have bare root plants um, and plugs. So bare roots are plants that have been grown in a field, like a crop, and then a machine comes and shakes them out of the ground, lifts them up and strips them of their soil. And then those plants are put into a refrigerator. So they're lifted out of the ground when they're dormant, and then they're put into a refrigeration unit to keep them in their dormant phase um, and to keep them cool so that their roots don't dry out. And then plugs here on the right side of the screen are little tiny plants. They have been grown in a super small container to establish their root system. And then those plants are popped out of that little container and you can put them in the ground as just a little start. So the pros of these two types of plants uh, stock are that they're inexpensive. We sell them generally for 50 cents to maybe $2 for each plant, which can be a real savings. Um, and they have uh, a good ability to adapt to our native soils and they're easy to transport. 
sometimes we get asked, you know, do I need to bring a pickup truck to pick up my plants from the plant sale? And generally you can fit hundreds, if not thousands in a Prius, like something real small. And so they're pretty easy to transport. Uh, some of the cons about that is that they have a narrow planting window. That planting window tends to be from um, when they're harvested. So generally we gotta wait until they're full on dormant. And that can be, you know, mid to late winter until you wanna get them planted while it's still rainy so that those roots can really get what they need um, so they don't dry out. So that's generally maybe January through April, if we're lucky. Um, and there are a few handling precautions so that they don't dry out. You wanna make sure that those roots are not exposed to a lot of air um, or exposed to a lot of sun before you get them in the ground because there's a, a higher potential for mortality. All right, so we can look here at the planting windows. So for container plants, we wanna make sure um, they, they, they don't really have that small of a window, you know, so we can put them in the ground. We wanna make sure they're in the ground when there is moisture um, so that, you know, when they're seeking out new soil, they're not just looking at, oh, my potted soil has moisture. I'm gonna stay right here. Um, but you can pretty much put them in the ground October all the way through April with those live stakes, those cuttings we were talking about. Those can be, you know, more late October. You want to wait until it's raining um, and those leaves have fallen off. You know, you want dormant plants before you put them, before you cut them. So that can be limiting. But um, once they're dormant, you can put them in the ground anytime that it is wet, sort of October through um, late February, March. And then the bare root ones, they lift them out of the ground in um, like mid-winter generally. So they aren't even available until later on. Um, but once they're available, you can put them in the ground anywhere January through say April. April might be pushing it a little bit depending on how dry that April is becoming. But um, if it's still rainy, you still have time and you can always baby them along a little bit by watering them if they're in your yard. All right, so we're gonna get into talking about some of these plants then. So first we're gonna talk about native uh, plants that enjoy moisture. So if your ground looks like this, if your boots get real mucky when you're walking through it, these may be good plants for you. Um, and these will all be options that we have at our native plant sale. So first here, we have one of our, you know, Pacific Northwest giants. We have Western Red Cedar. Um, this is an evergreen tree that grows to around 120 feet tall. Taller ones getting to be around 200. Uh, it prefers continually damp to wet soils and is both sun and shade tolerant. The more sun it receives though, the more water it will require. So if you don't have the ability to water this tree, do not put it in direct sunlight. It will have a hard time. Um, and cedars have rot resistant wood and have been used for building houses, boats, making clothing and many other things throughout time. They're really valuable to our ecosystem. You can see here, just close up. All right, and then here we have uh, red osier dogwood. This is a shrub and it prefers partial shade and moist to wet soils. Uh, this is another species where it prefers a bit of shade but can handle a bit more direct sunlight when it has water. This is one of the species I mentioned before that can be live staked. So you could take a cutting of this, stick it in the ground and it can continue growing. Say you wanna buy some 
you know, this year. And then in a few years, you'll have ones that you can cut and share with your friends. And this generally gets to be 15-ish feet tall. It can get a bit taller though. So it can be pretty large. And it has um, these white flower clusters. Uh, it's a uh, sort of unlike the typical dogwoods uh, that grow into full trees. They're, the flowers look a bit different and come in these tiny little clusters. And uh, it has this really nice reddish color. So even in the winter, when the twigs are all exposed, the leaves have all fallen off, they're um, an attractive thing added to your yard, a bit of color. So these twigs have been used in basket weaving, uh, probably because of that beautiful bright red color. Next we have twinberry. Twinberry is a shrub that prefers moist to wet soils and likes anything from sun to shade. It grows to be around 12 feet tall and have flowers that typically grow in little pairs, like its name, um, starting as a yellow flower and eventually becoming a brighter red color like you see in this picture. These flowers then become these dark purplish black colored berries that are in twins. And uh, they're not really edible to humans, but are enjoyed by birds. So they are a wildlife benefit. All right, so next year we have red elderberry. Red, elder, red elderberry is a shrub, but it can take on the appearance of like a small tree. Um, it prefers moist, shady areas where um, their flowers are a favorite for hummingbirds and produce red berries. Uh, they produce red berries that were once a very important staple food for Pacific Northwest peoples. Uh, however, their berries can cause nausea when raw, when eaten raw due to a chemical that breaks down into cyanide in our bodies. So it's always very important to cook them or ferment them properly. Um, we also have a blue elderberry. Oops, there's the red elderberries. Um, we also are gonna be selling a blue elderberry. And that blue elderberry uh, typically is found on the east side of the Cascades. However, it was brought over here through trading. Um, a long time ago, and it thrives here in sunnier, drier sites. And so that gives you, you know, if you want an elderberry, you have your two options depending on sort of where your property is located and how its, um, you know, water and sun conditions are. And it looks very similar aside from having blue instead of red berries. Next here, we have salmon berry. This is found in moist to wet places, including forests, stream banks, and open areas. They prefer partial to full shade and grow to be around 10 feet tall. They have somewhat small, but bright pink flowers uh, that become really tasty berries later on. Um, they grow fairly quickly and can form thickets, much like other rubus species. All right, next here we have Pacific Nine Bark. Pacific Nine Bark likes partial shade to sun and can thrive in wet or moist areas. So if you have an area that's really direct sunlight, and really wet, this can be a great option. It has these pretty white to pink blooms that become pink seed pods um, and are a valuable resource for wildlife in the fall. This plant is called nine bark because it's unique pilling bark that people believed grew in nine layers. Even though that's not true, the name stuck and the spark is pretty incredible looking. All right, 
Here next, we have deer ferns, which enjoy shade and moist soils. And they tend to stay on the smaller side, at least compared to say our sword ferns, um, generally growing to be around a foot tall and one to two feet wide. Um, they have evergreen leaves, the ones that lay flat, and they also have deciduous leaves that kind of shoot up from the center. So you'll have a green component and also another bit that sort of dies back during the winter. And as their name says, deer enjoy browsing on them during the winter. Oh, all right. And then last for our sort of wet loving species, at least the ones we're gonna to discuss tonight, we have a Pacific Bleeding Heart. So this is a ground cover. It's a bit unlike the one you see, you know, ornamental uh, bleeding hearts. It stays real low to the ground, growing generally less than a foot tall. Um, the flowers appear in the spring and are absolutely beautiful. They look like these cute little hearts. Um, as their name suggests, and the seeds, let's, uh, the seeds will, oh, there's a close up of the flowers, and then there we go, the seeds uh, shoot out of the center of those flowers and are in a green little pod, um, and they'll have little tiny black seeds inside that green pod, um, that in the forest at least are dispersed by usually ants and they get carried all over. And then that way the entire ground of this forest area can be covered in beautiful little pink flowers. All right, so next we're gonna move on to plants that love or can at least very well tolerate droughtier soils. <laughs> So first we have shore pine. This one tends to grow in a more twisted and sprawling form when compared to our pointier conifers in our region. It's actually the same species as that ultra straight lodgepole pine uh, that tends to grow at higher elevations, but due to the area it grows in, it has developed into a different form. Um, it is one of our smaller conifers. Um, on average, it grows 40 to 50 feet tall. And so it can generally fit in people's yards, even in an urban area. Um, it enjoys sun and can handle these drier conditions. Uh, although it can also handle moisture. Um, and it becomes drought tolerant once established. Usually that takes a few years, three, four, five years to become fully established. It may need a little helping hand in the meantime, but once it's established, it can handle uh, droughts pretty well. And these here are very valuable to our wildlife, um, many birds enjoy eating those pine nuts. Oh, there's the tall version of that tree, so you can get a feel for it. Uh, so next we have one of my absolute favorites. This is red flowering currant. It likes drier, open, wooded areas, rocky slopes uh, that have medium sun there's too much sun, they can, they can feel a little stressed, but generally they do pretty well. Uh, the flowers on here, as you can see, are pretty spectacular. They range from a lighter pink than you're seeing here up to this bright fuchsia pink and attract pollinators, um, especially hummingbirds, which can be fun to watch. Uh, the berries are edible. Whoops, sorry about that. Berries are edible, but unpalatable. Um, and at least to humans and wildlife can um, eat these. And so it attracts little birds and things like that to your garden. This one can grow to be up to 12 feet tall. 
but um, you can prune this species. It's, it's pretty accepting of being pruned to stay at a shorter stature. Uh, next here, we have Oregon grape. This is one of our few evergreen shrubs. And it, its uh, leaves are glossy and pointed, much like a holly. People can mistake them for one another in their smaller size. Um, it usually grows to be six to eight feet tall and can provide a year round privacy um, kind of fencing. And then it grows these bright yellow flowers that become these bright blue berries. Next here, we have ocean spray. So ocean spray is a large shrub growing up to 15 feet tall. It likes dry soils and can tolerate sun or shade. It has uh, lilac-like flowers um, that are cream colored and almost resemble crashing waves, which is how they received their name. These flowers turn a sort of light brick color after being this cream color and uh, stay on for a very long time, providing food for birds well into the fall. All right, next here we have Nootka Rose. So Nootka Rose gets to be up to nine feet tall and is a very robust rose, um, little unlike our garden ornamental varieties and uh, spreads rhizominously. So that means it has roots that it shoots off to the side that become a new piece so it can spread across your landscape. Um, it likes to get a fair amount of sun and grows these beautiful bright pink uh, five petaled flowers that you see here that later become these bright red rose hips and these will stick around into the winter providing a bit of color and another treat for wildlife to eat during the winter months. Here we have Kinnikinnik, a fun name to say, and this is a, an evergreen ground cover. Um, it is trailing, but has woody stems and can form thick mats. It likes sandy and well-drained soils and can do pretty well along, say, a rock wall. Um, it has these waxy, deeper green leaves, um, these tiny pink flowers, and then it becomes red berries. And then during the fall and winter months, these leaves can turn into a, a deeper sort of red color, which can be quite pretty. All right, and then next, possibly last, I can't remember <laughs> in this category, we have a uh, coastal strawberry. So coastal strawberry, um, likes drier soils, common near marine shorelines. Uh, it spreads with runners, which are like little vines that run across the ground, um, which are red or green in color and have little hairs all over them. It produces these super tiny, uh, delicious berries. And they don't tend to grow bigger than, say, your fingertips. So if you're waiting for them to, don't pick them before the birds do and, and have yourself a treat. Um, and they'll stay real low to the ground. But it, say if you put them in a pot, they'll drape over and kind of cover the outer edges. 
All right. And then our last category. So those were sort of our specialists, our falcons here, the ones that, you know, can handle a really extreme environment, uh, more wet, more dry. And then next we have kind of our crows. They can handle, you know, they, they can take or leave whatever. They can handle a wider variety of circumstances. So first here we have grand fur. Um, Grand fur is a bit more flexible for a conifer. Um, it may not like things that are super wet. It may not like things that are super dry, but it can handle sort of that middle territory. Uh, they get to be really tall, up to 250 feet tall, but it'll take a very long time to achieve that height. Um, and the cones are interesting because they shoot straight up. They're the only ones like just super vertical out of the bunch we're talking about tonight. Next here, we have vine maple. Vine maple is one of the ones that's really beautiful in the fall here. Um, it's a smaller, some would consider it a shrub, we'll consider it a tree in this case, uh, a small tree growing you know, 12 to 20 feet or so, which makes it pretty perfect for a smaller space like a backyard or just your garden. Um, they prefer moist soils and generally preferred mixed sun and shade. In the fall, their leaves become this vibrant orange or red. The more sun it gets, the redder the leaves become. And they produce little tiny red or white flowers. They're not super striking, but if you notice them, they are cute. Um, and then they have seed pods that are called samaras, but I like to call them helicopters because you can break them in half, throw them up in the sky, and they'll twirl down towards you, which can be a silly and sort of fun activity with kids. Next here, we have mock orange. Uh, mock orange tends to like drier, rockier soils and moderate sun, but it can handle, you know, a variety. Uh, the flowers are a huge draw. They're very fragrant and attract lots of pollinators. Uh, they look very similar to an orange tree's flowers, and so that's where they got their name. And these ones get to be, you know, around 12, maybe a bit shorter feet tall. Look at those beautiful flowers. Really nice. Next here, we have Oso Berry, which is another one of my favorites. It's a little more understated than, than uh, red flowering currant. However, uh, the reason it is one of my favorites is that it's one of the first plants to leaf out during the spring or even possibly in the late winter. Um, so it can even have flowers, you know, it's the probably one of the first plants to have flowers. And so this, when this plant starts, you know, sprouting its leaves, showing its flowers, it's like a little beacon of hope, you know, that the darkness is going to end soon and that you're going to have sunlight again someday. Um, and this produces these edible fruits. Um, they, I've been told, do not taste good at all. Kind of like a disgusting cucumber, but animals do enjoy them. So, you know, they uh, are valuable for them and can bring birds into your yard. And they're kind of pretty. Next here, we have thimbleberry. Um, they have these really bright, soft green leaves. And some people will call it like nature's toilet paper. Um, you can use them in the back country if necessary. Uh, they grow to be around eight feet tall and can thrive in a variety of environments. Uh, they like dry to moist soil and sun to shade. And um, they produce these white little flowers that turn into these super tasty berries. 
It's one of my absolute very favorite berries. And best yet, this plant is thornless, so you don't even have to fight with it to get those berries. All right, here we have uh, snowberry. So snowberry likes to grow in dry to moist soils and moderate sun. Leaves can have different shapes. Um, each one can be a little different. Sometimes they're lobed, sometimes they're nice and round. And so it can be pretty interesting to look and see the differences amongst um, a thicket. And um, <laughs> these berries tend to resemble, I, th I think they kind of resemble popcorn um, when they're on the bush. That's how I've always thought about them. Little clusters of white berries that are unpalatable um, and somewhat poisonous to humans. However, birds really enjoy them late in the winter when they can't find any other options. This is their go-to because these berries are left alone by most creatures. And so they're still there late in the winter when there aren't a lot of other food options. And they are really good for slope stabilization. They have these cute little pink flowers. All right, and then next here, we have Pacific rhododendron. This is the Washington state flower. It is evergreen and can grow to be very large, uh, 25 feet tall, sometimes even a bit more. You can see them next to people's houses, sometimes reaching the height of, say, their one-story house, the roof. Um, and, and maybe even going a bit over that, but they generally will stay around five to 15 feet tall. Um, very few animals will eat these plants because they can be toxic to some. However, uh, deer and mountain beavers are on that list of ones that will eat them. Next year, we have evergreen huckleberry. Um, evergreen huckleberry, you can usually find in the wild growing, say, on a nurse log um, in a partially shaded kind of forest environment. And so they prefer partial shade, moist soils, and typically grow to be around six feet tall. They produce these cute, tiny little pink urn-shaped flowers that become these super delicious huckleberries. Some people will go and pick them in the mountainsides and stuff, um, you know, in the later summer. And um, they're a really tasty treat. And birds agree with that. They, they think so too. Um, and so this is a great, uh, food source for birds if you want to promote birds in your in your uh, yard because the berries are available from midsummer all the way until early fall making them a wider um, lasting food source that's a shrub of that so you can see the whole picture and then here we have slaw, which we talked about earlier, uh, as a good replacement for ivy, having those egg-shaped leaves, the pink flowers, and the droop-like berries. Um, these are happy in sunny and shady conditions and are a common understory species in Western Washington forests. Uh, and the berries are edible and can be used for jams or pies. And here we have a uh, low Oregon grape. Um, low Oregon grape is smaller in height, usually growing to around two feet tall. It has evergreen leaves and prefers to grow in moist soils that have dappled sun or drier soils in more shade. Just like their tall Oregon grape brother or cousin, um, they um, grow these blueberries and bright yellow flowers um, 
their yellow flowers are a major attractant to our native Anna's hummingbird. And so they can, they can bring hummingbirds into your yard as well. And then last here, we have sword ferns. Um, sword ferns are excellent for erosion control. They have a really extensive root system uh, that's very fibrous and it can really go far deep into the soil and help hold your hillside in place. Um, they do well in dry to moist soils and like partial to full shade. Um, it is a Pacific Northwest landscape staple and can grow to be around four feet tall and four feet wide. So they get quite big in the right conditions. And then as these fronds die, they will fall down to the ground and that will become free mulch, which is wonderful, and a uh, habitat for our native amphibians. So they're provide you know a little a little interesting feature for for your yard there we go we get that sword shape all right so that wraps up all the plants we're going to talk about tonight um perfect thanks everyone for coming tonight <laughs>